I swapped into this body not knowing what to expect. You never do. It's part of the thrill. Mind swapping is like nothing else. It puts you in the hot seat, driving someone else's body as if it was your own. You live lives the likes of you and me could never imagine. Not really. Not like they really live. Like they really are. Vicariously reading books and watching TV is like taking a piss off a cliff. Swapping is taking a step over the edge blindfolded and careening head first up to your eyeballs into the filth of the gutter. The swap was going cheap, which is never a good sign, but the swapper said it was on the up and up and I'd swapped with him before. He said the guy I was swapping with needed some quick cash to settle a debt, and it being only a two day swap I decided to try my luck. And what luck? The guy I'd swapped with was a porn star. I looked into my pants and saw this huge one eyed cock winking back, fatter than a pack of porky whites and longer than my slack jawed face as I stared at it in awe. I thought I'd hit the jackpot, and as if on cue the telephone rang. Hey John, it's Marty from Screen Angels. Been a long time since I heard from you. His nasal voice crackled down the line. I've got a scene I'd like you to do tomorrow with Scarlet Velvet. You interested? Scarlet Velvet was one of the hottest performers in the adult industry, front cover material and willing to do anything to please her fans. Was this a setup or was I really getting the bargain swap of a lifetime? Hey Marty, I started. Of course I'm interested, baby. Where's it at? Christ, I thought. Is this how this giant cop talked like? It's being shot at some swanky joint in the hills. Meet me at Cafe Rouge at 4 and we'll take a ride together. I'm already there, baby. I went to put the phone on its cradle. One thing I learned from mind swapping is to keep it quick with people you don't know. John! Marty's voice shouted down the line. I raised the phone to my ear. What's the rush, John? I'm doing your favor here, buddy. Don't I get no thanks? I had to talk Scarlet into doing this scene with you. It took time. His voice hung on the line, silent. Then he tentatively started. Rumor is you're in bad shape. I'm hanging around with the wrong people. I'm fine, Marty, I said. Not fine at all. I don't, I don't know what you heard. I, I've got a little money trouble, that's all. I told him all the truth, or half-truths that I knew, thinking it better to play it straight. He seemed genuine. You are doing me a favor, baby. Thanks. I hope you're right, for your sakes. I had some of Frankie Cohen's muscle around here, looking for you. I put them off, but they were pretty persistent. He hasn't got anything on you, has he? I've never heard of him, Marty, I said truthfully. I've got to go now, Marty. I'll see you tomorrow. I had never heard of Frankie Cohen, but it didn't take me long to find out who he was. On the coffee table lay a face I vaguely recognized. When you swap, the cortical nerves retain certain memories specific to the host's body, just like glimpses, like drunken recollections to help guide you to never join in the dots. The crumpled front page of the Morning Star carried the headline, Mob Boss Frankie Cohen Released on Bail. I walked to the window and looked out over the neighboring three-story tenements. Heat waves rippled from their concrete facades. I took a packet of candles from my shirt pocket, lit one and inhaled deeply. My pulse quickened, but I didn't know if that was down to the coffin nails or the telephone conversation I just had. I needed to think, so I stuffed the cigarette on the floor and I left the apartment. I walked down the street at a pace, my mind working even faster. What could Frankie Cohen want? It had to be money, otherwise why would John do the swap? But what was the money for and how much? I wonder if Frankie Cohen played rough and I had a nagging feeling that he did. If only I could delay him two days, then I could swap back into my own body and John could use the cash from the swap to settle the debt. I carried on walking, not thinking where I was going, my mind on Frankie Cohen. Trying to push its way through my thoughts was the face of a beautiful girl. She was young, fresh-faced and dark-haired. Why John's mind was doing this I didn't know, but it never happened to me before when I swapped. Sweat prickles broke out on my forehead. The heat was close outside and I had built up a thirst. A gaudy bar sign appeared up ahead and in my mind there were blunted memories of good times. I went down the street stairs to the basement door. The cool darkness of the place swept over me as I entered my eyes adjusting to the sharp contrast of the bright street. I headed in the general direction of what I thought was a bar. Whiskey and soda, I said to the bartender, taking a stool. 
Shall I add it to the tab? Were you so high you're gonna make a scene if I ask you to pay? No, I'm good. My mind worked frantically to find a name for his face. I couldn't place it, so I settled for baby. Besides, there's no one here to make a scene for. How much do I owe on the tab? Five C's, brother, he said, placing the whiskey and soda on a napkin in front of me. But if you got Frankie Cohen's boys on your tail, my debt must be a hill of beans. I lit a cigarette to try and steady myself. Lilac plumes rolled over the dank surface of the bar. Why well, makes you think I got any troubles with Mr. Cohen? His boys were in here last night asking questions about you, he said, cleaning the glass. Oh yeah? What sort of questions? I was hoping he could shed some light on John's debt. You know, where you live, who your friends are, lady friends, that sort of thing. My mouth went dry. I took a sip of the whiskey and soda. It didn't help any. Well, and what did you tell them? I kept it as brief as I could. He stopped cleaning the glass and looked at me, but enough to satisfy them. I'm not messing around with those types, and I don't want to get involved with anything that's none of my business. How do they know to look here? He stared at me as if I was dumb. Man, you must have been wasted. I used to sit with them in that booth over there. They thought they were being discreet, but I knew they were dealing C. Yeah, I saw you doing lines on that table, hiding behind the drinks menu. Then you start acting all charged up, mouthing off if anyone got in your way or shot your funny look. But you're cooler today though, brother. Maybe it's because you're meeting someone. Yeah, maybe. But I've got no idea who you're talking about. Man, this guy liked to tell it like I'd never been there. He was gold to a swapper. Yeah, sure you don't. So happens that after Cohen boys turn up, some dame I've never seen before also comes in looking for you. She left her number. He moved to the cash register and rummaged around. That's what you came for, right? He placed a scrap of paper next to my drink. Uh, did she also leave her name? I asked, hopefully. Like I said, brother, I've never seen it before. I finished my drink, picked up the scrap of paper and left. Maybe this dame was the face John's mind kept wanting me to see. Maybe she was the key to knowing what I'd got myself into. I found a payphone a block away. The sun blazed down my neck as I dialed the number. After three rings, she picked up. I got a message to phone you, I said vaguely. John, is that you? She asked anxiously. Where have you been? Sophia needs to see you. Sophia? Who is Sophia? Why didn't she call me? You know she can't. She's too scared. I tried calling you, but there was no answer. I checked your usual haunts, but you weren't there and no one had seen you. I thought something bad had happened. What's the matter, honey? I asked. She's been to the doctors and she's had the test. It was positive. So that was it. John had gotten himself in debt and now her baby was on the way. She wants to meet with you. Yeah, of course, of course. If it's positive and, and she wants to keep it, I'll support her in any way I can. I didn't know if that sounded right for John, but it sounded like the standard line you use in these situations. What are you talking about? Are you crazy? No one wants it. If her father finds out, she'll be dead. So will you. Oh, okay, easy, baby. Where did she want to meet? She gave me an address for some place downtown, a bar I'd never heard of. I left the phone booth, lit another camel, and headed back to the apartment, my mind easing. The way I saw it, John must have landed himself in debt with Cohen and needed some money to keep him sweet. The baby was a mistake. There's no way some coked up porn star was going to go in for that kind of commitment. Her face appeared in my mind, Sophia. So young, so beautiful, how did she get mixed up with some lowlife like John? No wonder her father was pissed. Hopefully, I thought, the money from the swap would pull them out of this hole and give them a break. But that was the last thought I had as a sharp pain ripped through the back of my head and the sun faded to black. I came to in a room, tied to a chair and naked. A dull pain throbbed in my head and it was a struggle to open my eyes. Everything was fuzzy in the dim lit room. A face slowly came into focus in front of me. It was Frankie Cohen. 
Looks like we got us a prime specimen here, boys. Yes, a prime specimen. He laughed, more choked pain than mirth. Two other men in the room also laughed, forced laughter. There was nothing funny here. You owe me, John, Frankie said, waving a knuckle-dusted fist in my face. Uh, I pay, I said, struggling to get my words out. Just give, give me a few days. I got some cash coming. You owe me more than cash, you dirty bastard. Frankie snorted and spat in my face. He straightened up and started pacing in front of me, the bruised veins in his neck bulging. What the fuck did John owe him to make him so agitated? My only chance was to tell him about the mind swap before he exploded. Uh, I'm not who you think I am, I said, his spit crawling over my lips in strings. I, I did a mind swap. I'm not John. My name is... Frankie hit me with a straight from my blind side. His knuckle dust was connected with my jaw and I felt the cold metal on bone. He, my mind swam in a daze of blinding pain. I don't want to hear any bullshit, John. No one fucks around with my Sophia, especially no filthy black cunt. Sophia? I mumbled, my jaw in agony. You've heard, have you? She's positive. She's had the test. She can get rid of the baby. It's not too late. I begged, struggling in the chair. There's no baby, you dumb son of a bitch, he roared. She's got AIDS, and you gave it to her, and now you're gonna pay for killing my daughter. A blade flashed brilliant in the gloom when a searing pain ripped through my crotch to my gut. Blood spurted darkly onto my legs and the floor, pulsing rhythmically where my cock used to be. I screamed in agony. Frankie thrust a penis into my gaping mouth. The two men held me fixed either side and he duct taped over my mouth and nose. Blood filled my mouth with a copper tang. The dead meat felt like rubber. I gagged and vomited, my mouth and nose filling with the acrid taste of whiskey and bile. They left the room and the lights flickered out. The last triangle of light shrunk to nothing and the door closed with a click. I gasped for air and everything was dark. Thank you.